This is Capsule on LiveInLimbo.com. My name is Sean Chin. And I am Andreas Babilakis. This is an adventure into music, film, and pop culture. How are you, Andreas? I'm pretty good, thank you. How are you? I'm really good. Thanks for asking. Um, we've finally made it. 50 episodes. Can oh, you believe have, that? Can you believe that? We have it because I'm waiting for the hundreds. But yes, um, I, it's pretty good. I mean, it's in accordance to where we wanted it to be. Um, in fact, it's even closer because there's 52 weeks in a year. Um, we haven't reached just that yet, but um, we've just reached the 50 podcast mark. So um, obviously we've done our share of uh, double episodes per week, right? So um, – it's it's all an experimentation right now. Um, so we did try to do two episodes a week, and then it was just hard with like jobs and like going to concerts downtown. Yeah. We're trying to figure out when's the best time to actually record an episode, and then when we when we do get like a guest interview, then to just fit them into the whole schedule and pipeline of things. So we're still figuring it out. Like right now, we're recording this on uh, Saturday morning. Yep. I think this seems to be okay. I think so too. Well, considering that we've reached 50 and we're still figuring stuff out, I'd say that's not bad. Yeah. No, it's going to be an experiment for a while. Podcasting in general is is, is a rising medium. And uh, I think the mainstream is starting to pick up a lot of uh, podcast stuff. So let's go right into this. So we're going to do some follow-ups and then we're going to talk about the best of Capsule thus far. In our opinions. In our opinions, yeah. Maybe you like something else. <laughs> so okay. first off, uh, remember last week when I talked about uh, – when we talked about how the Billboard stuff is going on and Taylor Swift being the only platinum uh, album of the year? Yep. And then so I suggested – or I asked – this is obviously due to the rising um, trend of streaming – music on uh, platforms such as Spotify, RDO, Beats, and and also digital downloads from iTunes and the like. Um, and so Billboard announced that they will now be incorporating um, digital streams and digital track sales into the album chart for their Billboard Top 20, 200. What are your thoughts on that? Does uh, that make sense to you? It makes sense for what they're trying to target, but at the same time, um, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I think I'm just a little bit bitter because I'm more of a physical release person. So I, I think I'm trying to see something annoying here, but I, I maybe not. Maybe it'll come to me later on. But, but like, it makes sense because as time goes on, you're going to have less physical sales and more streaming and then therefore – no one will be able to get a platinum record. Right. But at the same time, though, um, is this just like each play is going to be recorded? I th They didn't say specifically, but what I suggested last week was if – you know how like when an artist releases something on Spotify – you've tried Spotify. I'll let you try that. Um, when you search for the artist, you'll see albums and then songs in that albums. So maybe if – uh, they detect a user, like each individual user plays maybe 60% of the songs on an album that would count as one album download. Yeah. Or, and the same goes for track sales. If you download on iTunes, if you download 60% of an album that would count as an album download. Yeah. And then hopefully next so year we'll see more platinum records. So if that's the case, then um, the numbers are going to skyrocket. And what, while we were struggling to get a platinum this year, now I believe that it's going to be catapulted way further now. Or at least maybe normalized. I don't know about normalized because if a lot of people are well, like going to be was, streaming. There was one platinum album this year. How many were like last year? At least more than one. Well, yeah, considering that last year probably had more sales and this year that they didn't even think that there would be a platinum album and there ended up being one. Um, if you're looking at each stream as being some sort of a sale, it's going to catapult the numbers drastically because think of it this way. It's as if Billboard was counting radio plays as sales. You know what I mean? Yeah. So 
you have people replaying songs. Like if you have a CD and you replay a song over and over and over again, Billboard's now taking into account each song play as opposed to how many albums of said music is being released. So um, this is going to change the numbers drastically. It's not even going to match. It's going to be above and beyond. Oh, that makes sense too. Uh, maybe they will count it per unique account ID then. Like, maybe. So each each um, user, like when you sign into iTunes or your uh, Spotify account, your unique ID can only listen to that album or those tracks once and it will be only counted once. And then every time you listen to it after, it's just a duplicate. Maybe. I think the reason why I'm bitter is because it kind of shows uh, Billboard's care for sales as opposed to actual legitimate quality, right? Which, which doesn't necessarily mean that the higher listened tracks aren't very good. But at the same time, you'll have a lot of songs with higher numbers that, you know, like it, it's basically Billboard's old model being revamped and possibly blown out of proportion you know what i mean yeah, yeah or, no, well they're they're trying to adapt to the new uh trend i suppose but at the same time like it's to me it's kind of a statistic where so and so was better just because they have more listens or whatever like it's a popularity contest like do you think with especially with youtube's um inclusion of well it's music devices now do you think that they're going to start including YouTube plays because suddenly Psy is just as good as, <laughs> as Michael Jackson. You Actually, know what I mean? Actually, that's a good point. Maybe they will. Maybe YouTube will or Google will partner with Billboard and then each um, video stream Gangnam Style gets will count. Which I think is unfortunate because you could tell that a lot of, no disrespect to Psy because I believe he's he's worked really hard and he's certainly not close to being like the worst or anything. He's not bad, but um, you could tell that a lot of plays or something are because of culture shock or because of like this meme uh, fascination that people have where things must be shared because such and such is so funny or this song is interesting. Check this out. You know, a lot of it isn't like people legitimately going out and buying this song. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, we'll see what happens. However, uh, the folks at Rhapsody, they wrote uh, an essay on Billboard titled Why Streaming in, in Brackets Done Right and Brackets Will Save the Music Business. This is what they said. If 90% of new releases from established artists were only available at launch on paid services, whether by purchase or as part of premium subscription services or through some new model – then consumers would quickly come to understand that premium services are the way to get access to the latest music. The result would be a win-win. More artists would be paid reasonably reasonable rates for their music. Aggregate industry revenue would rise and consumers would get excellent virus-free experiences and would know what they are paying for. And that's obviously directed to people like Taylor Swift. Eh, I, th I think a lot of that's marketing lingo because the only thing there that I think is kind of legitimate, if this is actually true, is the fact that the artists will get money. Now, if you the whole virus free thing, um, anybody who torrents and is wise will avoid that. Um, you know, and just like the accessibility, and this is how people got mo most new music. No, a lot of people who really care about music will grab their vinyl collection, like. I have. I don't know if you have one. Do you or not? Yeah, I have some. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So it's not a huge collection, though. Well, to start, though, I, I am mean, a streamer. That, that's what I mean. But you're heavily invested into music, and even you have started like a vinyl collection. And vinyl is a big culture which is coming back. And I'm not going to say that it's going to overtake streaming or anything. But if the sole focus is again on this demographic that is just listening to like radio hits or whatever they're forgetting about the massive amounts of people who are still collecting physical music because to them they just see this as um oh you know the radio has this many plays this and that um people online going to youtube and stuff they're forgetting about the massive amount of people who go to shop on record store day who shell out a lot of money to get that crazy insane edition of their favorite album even though they already own it you know like 
my vinyl collection I like a lot because there's a lot of stuff there that that's special. You know, it's not just the music. Like for instance, um, like I've gotten old albums from like the seventies. Yeah, the sleeves are worn out, but I I got it from back then, which I can't say about CDs. You know, like the latest you can go is eighties. You know, that's true. Um, I have signed records, whether I got them signed in person or whether I bought them online. You know, I have crazy double discs which come with insane features like beach house's teen dream comes with a video disc for instance i believe their cd does as well but well nonetheless um you know you got all these crazy features which are for music aficionados now having said that this billboard model is not just catered to a different type of audience entirely but it almost seems like they're it's going to squash this kind of model because um with its primary focus on streaming and whatnot, it's going to potentially put a lot of record stores into into trouble. Yeah, uh, I, I predict, anyways, which is unfortunate because um, this is probably my favorite part of music culture. Would be this, like, I the the people with record collections have so much to say about music, and you could tell that it's a heavy investment. It's not just something that they've checked out online and now, you know, it was okay. And then they moved on to something else. It's not just a fad. This is something that's deeply embedded into their, into what they love about music. And if that gets squashed while it's still already struggling, despite its uprise, then that's going to be very unfortunate. It's also a community. Like when you go downtown to a record store, such as cops, um, you just, or any other one like June records, for example, Sonic Boom. Sonic Boom. All those great ones downtown Toronto. You Gross just bitches. there's just like a when you walk in there, there's like a whole culture. Whether it's the the managers there, the cashiers there, the sales associates there, and then the actual customers there as well. You can always strike up a good conversation. Yeah, I believe the other day before I went to go see Slow Dive, I believe it was. Um, there's a record store around there. I can't remember the name uh, for the life of me, sadly, but. I bought um, PJ Harvey stories from the city stories from the sea. Oh my God. I love that one. And I bought uh, cocktail twins and yeah, I just started talking with uh, the cashier there about, you know, that kind of music. Apparently slow dive came in to buy some music. Like they bought Grace Jones. Oh really? Like, yeah. Like the same day or like that week, right? They were uh, the same day. Yeah. Did you tell them you interviewed them? Yeah, I did. I said, I interviewed um, Rachel Goswell and he, and he thought it was really cool. And they didn't believe you. No, no, he did. I mean, well, <laughs> well he just sold albums to them. Yeah. So uh, I'm sure out of anybody who's going to believe me, he would. And um, yeah, it was sad because he was talking about how the record stores are kind of struggling, how like not a lot of people are coming in. Like they'll have a lot of albums, especially ones that I asked if they had, but they had to ship them back because they weren't selling. It yeah. was really sad. Well, and that's true for all the brick and mortar stores now. Like Blockbusters is gone and all like the HMVs are suffering now and it will hurt the independent ones downtown even more. I think it's unfortunate because this whole anti-piracy thing that people have a big conniption about, they're targeting it in such a way that it's more about how many sales can we get as record labels as an ad, but not necessarily how can we strengthen music as a culture, yeah. you know? And I think it's, I think it's insanely sad because this is still sales that they'd be getting with record stores, but with its uprise, they're not taking that into consideration at all. I mean, record store day is a big deal for people like us, I would say, but to people outside of it, how big of a deal is it? Whereas so and so hit platinum, even though if they don't listen to it, it's oh, okay, that's significant. When not necessarily, because especially with this new possible idea, it's just how many people have listened to this one song, which doesn't necessarily mean it's good. I mean, yeah. let's say well, I linked you to a song yeah. and you hated it. You still you still contributed, yeah. you know? Yeah, so that's the thing, right? I don't know. The industry likes numbers. You know that, right? All business people just want numbers. Of course. Well, look at the film industry where if we considered sales to be actual quality, then a movie like, Transformers 2 is insignificantly better than the Hurt Locker, which I would disagree immensely with, but and that's like, obviously not the and case. Like Dumber, Dumber, Dumber and Dumber 2 is better than Interstellar. Right. Well, I haven't <laughs> seen Dumber Dumber 2, but apparently it's it's really bad, but I haven't seen it yet, so I can't say out of my own account, but... I'm pretty sure uh, more people have seen Dumber and Dumber than Interstellar. 
No, they have. <laughs> uh, apparently, according to uh, Rotten Tomatoes, Dumber Dumber 2 um, topped this week's oh, God. Uh, box office. Yeah, so, so that makes it better. If what well, we're if money, we're thinking, money wise, yeah, if we're looking sales. at billboards terms of success, yes, yes, it is actually, and I never got that because with that mold in mind, I I know I've said I'm not a fan of hers. A lot of people are. Maybe she's not that bad. I don't know, but even so, Katy Perry does not match Michael Jackson. Let's say, for instance, but according to Billboard sales and whatnot, with the amount of singles she's had out at once from one album, apparently she is. You know. And how do you dispute that? Well, it. Let's look at it this way: where she's popular right now, yes, but it doesn't mean that her songs are as good as his. It just means that she's extremely popular right now and you who's, know who's the one that gets to determine whose music is better than if it's not for the numbers well the masses i would say like okay putting Met- my Metacritic? music critic well yeah well yeah because that's an aggregate of all these uh, critical sources but let's let's put my music biases aside and say Katy Perry's done well for herself. She's obviously good at selling. Um, she knows how to target the industry, right? So she knows what she's doing. But she's not breaking ground like Michael Jackson did, you know? And yeah. I'm not somebody who would say Michael Jackson's the absolute king. Nobody's better than him. I was never somebody like that. But I still respect that his music was fantastic. A thriller is is great. Uh, um, Bad is great. Just He's had, like, a really good period where he influenced pop immensely. And basically the way I look at it now is kind of like old Madonna versus new Madonna. Old Madonna pushed, was revolutionary, challenged pop music sexually, challenged it within terms of what well, what woman meant in the industry. New Madonna is kind of like this new billboard model where it's just kind of targeting what's already popular and that's why it's selling, even though it's kind of the mold that she set in the first place you know what i mean yeah i totally get what you mean uh we'll see where this whole thing goes but we are definitely moving towards a more intangible future which again i don't know if i'm a fan of and at first i didn't have a good answer however but... imagine this so one day we'll be traveling out into space on like space stations do you expect to get your vinyls it's like, going to be digital streaming like in terms of like purchasing or yeah like you're on like a space station and then back on Earth or another colony, Katy Perry makes an album. They're not going to send the vinyls through a wormhole to get to you. They're going to send it via digital stream. Well, probably. But well, <laughs> first of all, let's say that I won't even reach that age where that will happen. We'll just say you're uh, great, 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 great grandchildren. Well, by then, I doubt they're going to be listening to my Daydream Nation album, I, I'm guessing. Andy which... Babiolakis the 15th. <laughs> Well, uh, p- potentially, that, that'd be a lot of them. Uh, that's a strong commitment for everyone. But um, actually, now that I think about it, Sonic Youth, Daydream Nation, and Space would be freaking amazing. But nonetheless, yes, per- perhaps that I am somebody who's clinging to the past, as are many of us. But at the same time, um, maybe they'll think of something like when that happens. Like maybe in space there'll be easier ways of bringing stuff up, you know? Oh, yeah, you're right. They'll probably have a teleporter by then. Now, with in terms of actually, or, okay, teleporting perhaps, but um, I was thinking along those lines, perhaps selling will be more difficult. Oh, oh, I just thought of it. It's 3D printing. They can do that. Ah, yes. See, that's actually a thing that's happening now. So there you go. Oh, shit. We just solved, like, the future of music downloads. Yeah, high five. I smacked my screen, I guess. But um, <laughs> you you do realize that that's already a problem people are having, right? Like I think like a you can year buy a ago? cup. You can buy a cup. You can buy like a car. No, not a car, not a car yet. But you can like you buy, can make the parts. Yeah, you can buy like physical things. You download it, and then it prints the physical object with your three D printer. Yeah, that's already a problem people are having because apparently, like two years ago or so, somebody actually three D printed a torrented um, Pixies album. And it didn't sound too good. Like on vinyl? Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> it didn't sound too good, but it was enough to tell what it was. So if they perfect it a little bit, that's a big, 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 big piracy thing that's going to start happening. Oh, that's a totally different thing now. Yeah, but okay, th- well, that's let's... already starting. So, <laughs> Wow. Yeah, good job, Andres. We did it. 
I, I, I suppose, <laughs> but I think I think with the whole Pixies album, I think somebody beat us to the punch. But yeah. um, okay, I, I guess within the confines of our own episode, yes, yes, we solved it within seconds. Good job. <laughs> All right, let's talk about something very cold. Did you hear about the whole massive snowstorm that trapped New York band Interpol for almost 50 hours in Buffalo? I did, because he messaged me in disdain saying I wanted to see Interpol. And yeah. Sarah happened. Ricks and I were going to go cover their show at the Cool House on Tuesday. And a few hours before, we got an email from their PR saying, show has been postponed due to snow. And then I went on um, the Globe and Mail, or was it yeah, the Toronto Star? No, yeah all these different news sources. And then you see Interpol, they tweeted like a picture from their tour bus of like pure white. Nothing's outside. There's so stuck. <laughs> basically the bus was their home. You're saying. Yeah. So basically they, they didn't get to cool house. They went to colder house. Uh, oh. I think this is the time you terminate me from live and liberal. No, this no, is, no, no, this no. is the moment where you say, I've had enough of your shit, Andreas, get off my site. I don't know why I chose you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but can you imagine that 50 hours and like at least they were on a tour bus like imagine the people behind them or in front of them that were in like normal cars like you must have run some people must have run out of gas or they must have or been food. starving or something yeah i mean was interpol the only band that this happened to i'm sure it happened a lot um, more but were they like the biggest? another band called Anne berlin that was supposed to play in toronto also had their show postponed i don't know if they were stuck in snow as well but snow did stop them from making it here Okay, so it happened to like a few, I, I presume. And last night, actually, uh, I don't know if it was weather related, but uh, some people were saying that it was. Um, while Death Heaven were supposed to be on and their opening band program was supposed to be on at like nine, members of Death Heaven were still stuck in Boston and they virtually like sped their way here as quickly as possible. They had like a guy come on stage saying, oh, they're finally reaching us through the DVP. Uh, they're almost here. Oh, really? So they barely made it too. Yeah. And like you just saw them at like they were supposed to end at 11. You saw them at quarter past 11, like running on stage, strumming a guitar. OK, that sounds fine. Leaving, leaving the stage and then coming back home when the show actually started. Like they, wow. they booked it on there. I've never seen a sound check that quick. Like they were <sighs> panicking. I mean. Wow. OK, um, so imagine if that Death Heaven show was like a day before that probably would have been canceled. Yeah, absolutely, because they were in a similar situation, except instead of Buffalo, they were um, Boston. But they would have had to have yeah. gone through Buffalo, I'm yeah, guessing. Yeah, a lot of bands go through Buffalo to get here. Um, so Interpol, yeah. luckily, they're alive. They managed to get out after about 50 hours, and they survived off of, get this, guess what they survived off of? Um, I'm not going to guess 127 hours um, mode of thinking, so uh, it's probably not urine and eye contacts. Um I have no idea what. Vodka and ramen noodles. Ah, that kind of sounds like a university party then. <laughs> On a tour bus. Yeah, well, that's not too bad. Uh, no, it, it's probably something. garbage. It's probably terrible, but yeah, that's... That would have been a tragic way to go. Here yeah. lies Interpol, dead in the snow. With vodka poisoning. <laughs> oh my god, yeah, that could have gone so bad but good thing they're alive and hopefully they reschedule their tour for toronto and montreal and i think they canceled another one as well oh, it's unfortunate because interpol regardless of if you really like them or if you don't they're actually pretty damn good live so yeah. you saw them at a field trip i did and i like older interpol i'm really not a big fan of their newer stuff but even so like they were just fun live like everybody was was having fun they were like easy going they talk to the crowd a lot they moved around a lot you know they, they were fun they're fun yeah. and yeah hopefully they reschedule so you can see that yep all right let's get to our best of the capsule podcast thus far so i wanted to say something first so we started this project earlier this year in january of 2014 I've been mm -hmm. fascinated with podcasts for a number of years now. Um, so some shows that I subscribe to um, are – there are a variety of different topics. But so one category I like is tech. Um, I listen to the talk show with Gon uh, John Gruber of DaringFireball.net. He talks a lot about Apple and technology and stuff like that. 
um, Accidental Tech Podcast and Tech Pinions, just to name a few. And then another category I like is like pseudoscience-y kind of cryptozoology stuff like Mysterious Universe. That's one of the most well-produced podcasts out there. And then The Graylian Report with Micah Hanks. I listen to some comedy ones, um, What the Fuck Podcast with Mark Marin, of course, and uh, The Joe Rogan Experience, which I like. Um, and then I also listen to some more uh, narrative award-winning podcasts such as This American Life and 99% Invisible with Roman Mars. And then in September of 2014, which is about three months before we, we started Capsule, I began to hev heavily uh, investigate what sorts of things one needs to produce a great show. Uh, I looked up things such as microphones, uh, recording software, headphones, cables, hardware, and also like things like the show format, how to get guests on, and then using equalizers and leveling the audio and so forth. Um, so a great podcast doesn't need the best gear in the world. Uh, you just need great content. That other stuff is just the cherry on the top. And also what makes a great podcast is a great co-host with a wealth of knowledge on a topic. And that's where you come in, Andreas. Um, really? I was going to say, like, you chose me with, with that criteria? <laughs> yes, yes, I did. <laughs> and, uh, okay, no, actually, I'm kidding. I'm privileged. Actually, you did the entire first Thanks, episode you. of Capsule on your own, uh, which was the top 25 films of 2013, as I was sick, but I was super uh, adamant about getting the first episode up on January 1st as a big surprise to our readers of Live and Limbo. Um, yeah. This is, I would, I describe Capsule as a director's commentary or the audio enrichment version of liveandlimbo.com and boy have we come a long way uh we've had musical guests uh <clears throat> three to one we've had musical legends and rising stars on the show all in this one year um as well as in-depth enriching discussions with fascinating people in the music scene uh, so one of my favorite interviews that we did was with Anthony Fantano of The Needle Drop. And I also really enjoyed our talk yeah. with Elephant. And then my talk was Sky Sweetnam of Sumo Psycho. Um, and of course, we have to thank our very first musical guest, The Box Tiger, our friend Lauren Chan's the drummer there. Yep. And then the thunder kept on going with St. Lucia. And then I think our first uh, milestone, which was our 10th episode guest, Las Vegas. So you yeah, know, thank you to everyone there, and thank you to you. And I just wanted to know what what did you think of this whole pro project that we're working on now? I think it's gone pretty damn well. I mean, it went from being a like a simple podcast where we just wanted to speak our minds and stuff to really even doing some really rare events i mean the fact that we got michael jira of swans at all um i think was pretty rare and then the fact that that led to anthony fantano who actually released a video saying that he was going to be interviewed on a podcast like that's how rare it is to get an interview with him the fact that he actually made it a bit of a video blog i i don't know if he was drunk or high i don't know <laughs> what he was but but um you or if you were just being goofy but he was clearly like like just having fun you know like the whole so there are these two guys who want to interview me you know like if you've they seen the video they have a podcast <laughs> they have a podcast yeah so uh he's having fun or something i don't know but yeah they actually like he he actually made a video saying that these two guys referencing us oddly enough wanted to interview him and that's that's just how rare it is to actually get an interview with him so that snowballed because of Michael Girard with Swans. And you know um, how nervous I was for the Michael Girard interview, right? <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I do know. I just said, look, he's a cool guy. Just don't say anything stupid, which I think is the basis correctly. of any podcast. Yeah. Oh, um, actually, before, let's, we could do some behind the scenes. Before the podcast even started, he was like, okay, are we already three? Two, eight, eight? And he said, wait, 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 hang on a second. What's my name? <laughs> and I think. I have a feeling he said that because a lot of people call his, call him like Michael Gira or Michael Gara or something. I, I'm not sure, but I have a feeling if you said his name wrong, he would have hung up. You would have hung up, I think. Probably, right? It would have shown that you don't you didn't do any research. And I, I have a feeling that he only does like 
actual legitimate interviews, not people who just want to just have big names or anything. You know what I mean? So I, I was hoping that you would have like spoke, said something. Oh, like when he said that? Yeah. I have a feeling he was asking you though. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good thing that worked out though. I was like, Phew. <laughs> yeah. And he said, okay, cool. Let's continue. You must've had like a big sigh of relief too. Yeah. Cause for a split second I said, oh God, like, God, Sean, say the right Sean, name. Sean, <laughs> Sean, the person who said Brian Eno's name was Brian Eno, please, I told you how to pronounce his name. Be careful. And he said it right. So I was like, okay, good. Everything, everything is okay. Everything continued. Uh-huh. I think the great thing about that, the neat thing is that we actually, you can like link the whole thing in like a sequence of stories. So like we did the Michael Girard interview. And then in that interview, he says, interview Anthony Fantano. Yeah. We email Anthony Fantano. Then he posts on his um, vlog the next day with that whole podcast thing. And then we yep. do the interview with Anthony Fantano. And then he retweets it. It's like a whole chain reaction. Yeah. And it's it's interesting because this is the kind of culture that I'm talking about. You know, this isn't the billboard culture. This is, again, like the heavily physical release fanatic. Like, obviously, if you've seen the Needle Drops videos, Anthony Fantano's got a pretty big vinyl collection considering i think he's only kind of just started heavily buying um he's gone on to say that he's been given gifts along the years and he has some albums that he's gotten through family i believe but like his own personal collection he's only started like a few years ago and he's got like hundreds i'd say um it's just indicative of that culture because it's not about oh this famous person wants to talk to me that's so cool it's oh boy this person that I idolize wants to talk to me. I want to get mm-hmm. to know him on a deeper level. And um, did they ever interview each other? I don't know. I don't. I never saw anything about that. But yeah, Anthony F- F- Anthony was really appreciative that he would even bring him up in the first place. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I mean, even with us, he was appreciative. He said, "I checked you guys out. It seems like you guys kind of know what you're doing." Um, he said, "We have our I, shit together." Yeah, he said, "Yeah, that will forever be in our quotes." Capital you have podcast. Sh- you guys have your shit together, says Anthony, Anthony Fantano. <laughs> Absolutely. Once once he becomes like a mega millionaire, like top of the top, that's what we're gonna put on like the front of our site with like you know like the the festival garlands yeah. that you see on like yeah. film posters. Yeah, with that testimonies. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. we've had our share of um, fan mail and hate mail, and who cares about the hate mail? We just want the the good stuff from. Like, oh, what hate mail have we gotten? Oh, like yeah, like tweets and stuff. Like Ran- what? Like random tweets. I don't know. We'll find. I'll show you. I, I think one episode we should do a Kimmel version of that, where we just read our mean tweets. Or I could read over some of my um some of my reviews, which have gotten some charming responses. Yeah. Like, like I don't know. Um, you don't deserve to have a degree, which I got on my art pop review. Or um, I think I'm gonna follow suit with uh, people like Daring Fireball and Recode and Wall Street Journal and the like, and disable uh, comments. Because if you w- really want to say something, you can uh, tweet us or Facebook us or something. I no, I think you should keep them because you know it, it's some people want to have positive ones, some people have negative ones. I think it, it takes away from if the negative the, ones are constructive, then I care. It takes away from the article itself. Well, no, I personally think that if you're the kind of person who's going to read the comment and believe it before you read the article, you're the kind of person who will see a 93 on Rotten Tomatoes and say, okay, this movie's good. But you don't look deeper and look at the fact that the average rating is actually 6.5, you know? Yeah. And the peop- like the critics are saying, well, this, this is not bad. You just look at the 93 and that's all you're content with and you go see this movie. You know what I mean? It's yeah. You've got to look deeper. And if you don't, then... I, I personally don't even care, you know, so I say keep the comments on, okay. <laughs> actually. <laughs> and so what were your other, what, what were some of your other favorite moments of the podcast this year? Well, I really liked... Um, like what topics or guests? Well, Human Kebab from You Pick Up Synergy Seeker, I think that was like one of our first... Um, one of our first big praises, like as soon as we started, like he was having a ball. He was saying, oh, man, that's such an introduction. You guys are awesome. We should hang out. Um, and we had, a, we had a good interview. So um, I really liked interviewing him. Um, I think my favorite interview interviewee so far was Rachel Goswell of Slow Dive because she was so open. But at the same time, I feel like um, I'm usually somebody who was wishing for guests who weren't reserved or please give us something to work with. And I think that was like kind of like the first test where – you could really open somebody up and you still have to find a way to work around that because she went into some really like in-depth personal stories. You know what I mean? And I didn't know, I didn't know how to continue from that without being disrespectful. You know, I agree. 
So it was a bit of a lesson while at the same time I got to interview somebody I'm heavily fond of, like so Dive were amazing live as as I said on here. Um and I've loved their music for a while now and um she had a lot to say. She was very nice, funny, you know, caring about the podcast and what she would deliver to it. But at the same time, she really opened up and I didn't want to take advantage of that. You know, I didn't want to be exploitive, which I never thought I'd be in the position of. But yeah, I agree. I hope I worked my way around it no, without, yeah. you know, no, like exploiting. And yeah. I, I really enjoyed uh, Elephant. She was really good. That was yeah, a very Elephant fun too. episode. Yeah. And the fact that we got to meet up with her before her um, opening show with uh, Charlie XCX. Charlie X. Yeah. Um, no, she's really cool. And also really laid back um she seems to know what she's talking about especially in terms of sweden when i had questions about that um <laughs> yeah. no she's really cool and well she's really cool with us too i mean she, uh, she seems to be like a big fan of us i suppose yeah. um i also really enjoyed when we talk about film stuff i think we've only done three film episodes out of the 50 now which was her transcendence and interstellar hopefully we'll do more well, um, considering the Oscar one as well, let's say four. Oh, yeah. I, I really enjoy when we get like other people from the site on the show as well. It can be hectic with four people, but it's fun. So we did like uh, CMW uh, with Dakota and Sarah. Then we did North by yep. Northeast with them as well. And then we did the Polaris one with Randall and Dakota was there too. Yep. Well, awesome. he ran the whole show. It was, it was yeah, his, that was his show. <laughs> We also did the Oscars with um, Dakota again and Adriana Floridia, which um, ho we hope to have her back on the show because she's she's done really well for herself. Actually. Oh yeah, she she's has always a, got good things yeah, to say. Yeah, and she has a new site too. We can plug that. What's that called? Freshfromthetheater dot com. Yeah, absolutely. And then we've had a guy on a number of times. He's always got some. He's probably like the philosopher of our site. I would say yeah. he's got some really in depth things to say. Always. He can talk about the Grammys and then transhumanism. Yeah, all within all, all within one second, where it's like, um, one day the Grammys will we will be a part of the Grammy ceremony because uh, of transhumanism, where we will all be one singularity or whatever. But <laughs> I don't know. But uh, yeah, no, he's always got some interesting things to say, and especially with his with his past history of how he got into the country and everything. You know, he's and then also um, you've got to like interview people in person, and then we put some of those. Uh, snippets onto the podcast so you enjoyed speaking to deaf heaven and sonata artica and the new pornographers yep and who else have we talked to um i don't know you talked to them <laughs> <laughs> oh who was my first one my f well aside from the divergent red carpet oh was that x ambassadors was that my first it might have been um no uh my first was La Dispute. Oh, yeah, La Dispute, yes. La uh, Dispute was the very first one, and that was... And so the, I guess when we put that, when we interject those onto the podcast, what what is it like being there in person? It's different, but, right? Oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, with the podcast, you can't see their facial reactions. I mean, like Michael Girard could have been smiling the whole time, basically saying, oh, you know, these guys, these guys are so worried or whatever. It's, it's nothing. It's cool. But you can't see them with a podcast because you can't tell. Now, in person... If you're saying something and you can kind of see their facial reactions and it's like, okay, maybe they don't want to talk about this or let's veer it somewhere else. Um, you know, it's it's easier to gauge. Now, <clears throat> having said that, I just want to bring up something quickly where I believe there was a back about um, the negative comments. I got this one comment where somebody said I need to go to journalism school because I ask questions on the fly. I don't have questions prepared. I've done that before where I have gone in with questions prepared. I believe I've done it a few times with Sonata Arctica. I certainly did. And even the new pornographers where that comment was posted on that video, I did as well. But I veered off from those questions. Now, I personally believe that it's disrespectful to come in with loaded questions because you go to these people who are not everyone's there to just promote a product. You know, um, some people are, are there to genuinely get their thoughts out. And if I come in with loaded questions, I feel like I'm ignoring them. You know, like if I asked you, um, what do you think of Polaris? And you say, oh, this, this or that instead of. Instead of, you know, continuing the conversation, I instead ask, okay, what about Sundance Film Festival or something? You know, it's suddenly you have to, I've completely discredited what um, you've had to say. Now, I can understand why people would think that's better because 
journalism can be used as a form of advertisement, but that's not what I wanted to do with Live in Limbo ever. I've always wanted to kind of jog the minds of those that I'm interviewing. And that's why sometimes when I first started off, I'd ask some really complex questions where they didn't have answers with. Now that I didn't do too well, but um, I've always wanted to have a discussion, not simply a loaded um, audible journal that I'd have where this is what I wanted, this is what I got. I wanted to get to know these people and have them speak their minds. That was my goal. So that's why I'll come with, I've always come with some sort of questions kind of prepared in my mind in case things get really stale, but I genuinely want to continue with whatever they're talking about because, you know, in the end, they're people. I'm not trying to sell some new slap chop, you know? Yeah, I totally agree. I think there's some interviewers out there. I think Larry King was one that said he goes into an interview with like no question. Yeah, and I, I, that's how I think it should be. And Craig Ferguson, I believe it's the same way. Like he, as a joke, even he'll always rip up his cue cards just to show that it's all on the fly, you know. So um, that's that's my that's how I prefer it. And if I still need to go to journalism school, perhaps. But if you're willing to pay for me, then yeah, so be it. You know, <laughs> exactly. Then I will. Then I will go. Then I will go. But for now, I don't think I, you need to go. I think you're just fine the way you are. You're well, thank you. Of course, I need. No, oh, I'm not perfect. I I need some vast improvements, and all the time I'm thinking, okay, how can I? How Over can I time, we'll get better. This is still an experiment. Yeah, I, I'm treating this as not a school, but as like a garage where I'm learning how to fix a car by doing. You know, so learning on the fly. I'll yeah, hopefully I'll get better by doing that. Um, but I, I just feel that if you come with strict questions beforehand and you want to just get through those questions, I think it's loaded. I don't like that. These these are people. You know, I want to get to know them. Get to know them like as a human. And Mike, uh, Mark Marin, uh, when he did his keynote address at uh, North by Northeast, he said. Um, when when he does his uh, one-on-one interviews with guests, which usually lasts about an hour, he can find that that gem of the five minutes of true truthiness, if that's a word. Stephen Colbert uses that word. But yeah. like, there's five minutes of gold truth that you can get from it. Well, like we did with um, Rachel Goswell, right? Yeah. We didn't ask loaded questions. We we had a discussion and she opened up with us and like it was it was actually really touching because the fact that she wanted to share that moment with us that I mean that it showed that she trusted us which we wouldn't have gotten had we said how was this festival it was good thank you and then she opened up about that and then suddenly we just asked cool so slow dive is a band you know how was that you know like if we asked these loaded questions suddenly guards will go up you know yeah. like if um you can notice in some interviews, if you look really hard online, you'll see that like, some people have their guards up because they they don't like being asked the same questions over and over again. Like Tyler, the creator, is pretty open about this where he's actually been kind of disrespectful. But you know, he's still nonetheless being open about the fact that he hated getting these same questions over and over again. You know, so yeah, that makes I, sense. I just prefer to get to know these people. Yeah, yeah. I want to get to know them too. And so that's why I, maybe people don't know this, but behind the scenes when I – reach out to people or when um, PR people reach out to me about being on the show, I'm highly selective of who I want on the show. I've actually rejected or not rejected, but turned down a number. Maybe in 2015, I'll open up a little bit more. But I usually, uh, for this year at least, I wanted to have real quality people of high caliber who are n- not just legends, but also up and coming people as well, such as Lion and Sydney York, for example. Um, and of course the box tiger, but I always try to say, we would like to speak to you for at least 30 minutes because there's editing in there as well. And the least, and then sometimes they'll try to negotiate down. Like when you do a typical interview with someone, they'll say 10 minutes, right? But yeah, that's not a pot. That's not podcast worthy. So then the least I would actually go down to is about 15 minutes, which is what happened with Taylor Momsen. I'm so grateful that happened though. Yeah. Well, I think if the 10 minute thing happens again, I think we should just have it incorporated with other um, topics. I know, but you can't get much out of it. You can't build a strong rapport in that 10 minutes unless you know them from before. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. You can't really get to know somebody, and um, that's kind of like what we want on on this site, you know, where the video or audible um, pod, podcasts or interviews, you know, we'd rather have 
interviews where we could stir their brains again. Now, when I went on to the Divergent Red Carpet uh, premiere, I actually, um, that was my big focus because I didn't know how much time we had. So I thought we had like maybe a few minutes, but no, it was, it was very quick. So I said, okay, what's you got the one most, question? <laughs> yeah. One question for each. I was like, okay, so what's the most thought provoking thing I can ask? Well, everyone else is asking, how did you prepare? How did you prepare for this movie? Um, what's it like with your co-star? You know, I wanted to ask something relevant, you know, is that um, really what other people asked with their one question? Well, I didn't get a chance to hear, oh, okay. but, um, I looked at other, um, videos and I, I won't say which because I'm kind of talking down about them, but um, you could tell like this, the very same people I interviewed uh, and they were interviewed before uh, and they were interviewed by them before I interviewed them. Uh, you know, like their responses were not nearly as open as mine was, I would say. Like they kind of seem a bit more reserved, I guess, because it was a question they were tired of answering. Yeah, that's um, true. But with me, I tried to ask something interesting and something that was kind of thought provoking. And I don't know if I, if I achieved it, but they seemed... It seemed like they they felt refreshed because they said, "Okay, we have something that we could actually talk about." Now, I don't know if she, if Shailene Woodley's answer is something that she said often, but if not, she's actually referenced uh, our discussion in another article. I don't know if I ever told you that. Again, I was the only person that she answered with that question with that answer with, um, because she was talking about women in in film. Right, because I was I was I referenced Kate Blanchett's Oscar speech, asking uh, Shailen Woodley if uh, equality was was finally on its uprise in film, and she said that women tend to push themselves down in the industry, but they have to they're the ones who kind of have to push as well. And she actually referenced that in another article. And again, I don't know if she's used this answer a lot, but if not, she referenced something that we talked about. So that's that. That's actually pretty cool. I screenshot it anyways. I don't care. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. All right. So I think uh, that wraps up our 50th recap episode. Uh, I think it's going really well. And hopefully we do hit our 52 episode marks, at least by the end of the year. I think we will. We shouldn't have a problem with that. We'll have a, a live in limbo uh, 2014 wrap up podcast um, that should make it to 52. So then we'll have an episode for every week of the year and we'll see in 2015 maybe there'll be more we'll see how that how it goes well then again with this we didn't expect too much and again look at some of the stuff we pulled off right amazing job where can all of our listeners find you andreas well for the 50th time you can find me on twitter at andreas Babs. you can find myself on twitter at sean chin um, and you can follow the show at Live in Limbo and use the hashtag Capsule Podcast to join in on the conversation. Please subscribe to the show on iTunes. And as always, you can find the show notes at liveinlimbo.com slash capsule. Take care. Have a good one.